Uh, our next speaker is uh, Preeti Jyoti from IIT Bombay. Preeti finished her PhD from Ohio University. And after a postdoctoral stint is now uh, back to the country and she's faculty at IIT Bombay uh, with interest in speech, uh, accent adaptation, and machine learning. Preeti, over to you. Thanks a lot, uh, Satish. Uh, and thanks to the organizers for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. Um, so today, um, I'm going to be talking about state of the art in speech technologies. So my brief plan for the talk is um, that I'm going to focus mainly on the two most prominent speech technologies, which is speech recognition and speech synthesis. So it's a, uh, going to be possibly a little more targeted than the previous two talks. Uh, I'll give a brief history about both these uh, speech technologies. Uh, I'll talk a little about the composition of state-of-the-art systems. And um, as someone who works on speech, a question that you often get asked is, isn't speech a solved problem? And the answer is no. So I am going to spend some time talking about lots of very interesting open problems and uh, a couple of directions which are particularly interesting to me. Um, right. So like Professor Rajradi said today morning, uh, there's been tremendous progress in speech technologies, particularly over the last decade. So all of us in the audience are familiar with probably at least one of these applications. So Skype currently supports um, speech to speech translation. Uh, Siri and Cortana, of course, are personal assistants. Uh, vo Google Voice is a voice-driven web search. Uh, Amazon Echo is a device which is entirely driven by voice. So that there isn't even an alternate mode of input. Um, so these days, you know, without a thought, we'll use voice to search or uh, instead of typing, you just speak and then your, your text message gets rendered and so on. Uh, so uh, Cortana and Siri, of course, are dialogue systems, but uh, the two main uh, speech-related technologies at the front end is your uh, speech recognition engine, which automatically translates spoken uh, utterances into text. And at the back end, you have text-to-speech systems, which does the reverse, which is it uh, reads aloud text, any form of text. And so I'm going to focus uh, predominantly on both these speech technologies. So these are just uh, some kind of uh, very popular applications, but there are many, many other applications of these speech technologies. So some of you might recognize Dragon, which is a, a very popular dictation system. Um, our uh, GPS uh, systems are voice enabled, so there you have uh, text-to-speech um, working. A call center, so all of us have at some point uh, had typically unsuccessful interactions with uh, voice-driven agents. So that is, there is an issue there, and it's predominantly because of accents. So that's something I'll talk about when I talk about open problems. And um, another application is screen readers. So this is um, very useful, especially for uh, people who are visually challenged. And um, another application, a nice application of speech, I think, is that it uh, makes technologies accessible even to users with disabilities and users who cannot necessarily read or write. So there is uh, also. Uh, potentially a lot of uh, social significance to developing speech technologies. Okay, so um, as it typically grows, I mean, progress is made by standing on the shoulders of giants. So uh, it'll be remiss if we don't talk about the history of uh, speech recognition and speech synthesis. Uh, and both these uh, fields have very, very rich histories. So this is by no means meant to be a comprehensive um, representation of all the important systems. So I'm just kind of dotting um, the most important systems over the last few decades. So I'll start with this really um, small, tiny toy prototype, which um, is known as Radio Rex, uh, started back in 1922. So you have this tiny celluloid dog, which uh, sits inside a kennel. It is uh, controlled by a spring, which in turn is controlled by an electromagnet. And this electromagnet is sensitive to frequencies around the range, 500 hertz. And that happens to be the frequency of the air bubble inside Rex. And so when someone says Rex, the jog, dog would jump out of the kennel. Um, so this is, of course, a cute prototype of recognition in quotes. But it has a terrible false rejection rate. So it does not work for, with women. It does not work with children because it's hard-coded. Uh, but this is maybe one could say this is the very first prototype of a speech recognition system. So it's exactly recognizing one word, and it's a frequency detector. So there's absolutely no learning happening here. Uh, in 1962, IBM um, demonstrated this uh, system, which is known as Shoebox. 
and it recognized uh, uh, some total of 16 words, and it was something which, which could do arithmetic operations. So um, you have 10 digits and six arithmetic operations, and you could uh, add digits and so on. So now you slowly progressed from one word to 16 words, but this is all still isolated word recognition. And then um, in 1971, uh, Alan Newell came out with this report which defined some goals for speech uh, understanding research. And um, there were a few teams in the US, and one of these teams were led, was led by Professor uh, Raj Reddy, who, um, and they all worked on uh, improving state of the art for speech recognition systems. So the CMU developed a string of very uh, important systems and also introduced a bunch of techniques which are used even to date in state-of-the-art ASR systems. So Dragon, Harpy are some of these systems. Dragon uh, was one of the very first speech recognition systems which actually modeled the whole, um, the whole um, uh, problem as a stochastic process. Harpy was the very first to introduce the search technique called beam search which uh, many of you in the audience, if you're familiar with speech technologies and language, you've used beam search. It's one of the most prominent approximate search techniques that are still used today. So this was uh, kind of a very influential year for speech recognition. And so this uh, Harpy system um, was able to successfully recognize up to 1,000 words. And now we are in the realm of connected speech. So we're no longer looking at isolated speech, but connected speech. And this kind of um, heralded the age of uh, statistical models for uh, speech recognition. So hidden Markov models were a very popular um, machine learning paradigm that was applied to this problem. And there were multiple groups who were in parallel kind of uh, pushing the uh, state of the art. So there was um, the CMU group. There was a group at Cambridge uh, led by Steve Young. Uh, there was uh, Fred Yelenik at IBM who's uh, credited to be the father of uh, speech recognition. And all of them were working on how to best make uh, HMMs work for the problem of speech recognition. And so now slowly we moved from 1,000 words to 10,000 words and more. And uh, these are typically referred to as large vocabulary uh, speech recognition systems. And now we are in the age of uh, deep neural network based systems. So all state of the art uh, speech recognition systems use um, uh, DNNs as one of their uh, components. And um, the first system which very successfully used DNNs was in 2009. It was a collaboration between researchers at MSR and uh, University of Toronto. And they were able to show that a deep neural network based acoustic model significantly beat um, an existing HMM based model uh, by a very significant margin. And this was on a benchmark which had plateaued for a long time. So this generated a lot of interest. And since then, it's just been leaps and bounds. So over the last six years, there's been phenomenal progress. And uh, it has kind of all been thanks to various forms of uh, deep learning within these speech recognition systems. OK, so this is uh, kind of charting the uh, error rates. So it's tracking performance of um, speech recognition systems on various tasks over the years. So on the um, uh, x-axis, you have the years of evaluation. On the y-axis, you have the error rates. And uh, there are different, okay. Uh, so there are different types of uh, speech tasks. So you have read speech, which is when you're actually reading out text. And this is, of course, going to be easier than recognizing conversational speech, which is much more spontaneous and harder to recognize. So the, um, the points in black correspond to read speech. And you can see that as early as 1992, 93, the error rates were as low as 3%. But the, the points in red are um, the points corresponding to a conversational speech task. And so this uh, benchmark is known as switchboard. And you can see that switchboard, of course, is a much harder task. And even in 2004, the switchboard error rates were um, hanging, they were kind of dangling around 13%. And this was the case for a long time um, until uh, the last three or four years when significant amount of progress was made on these benchmark tasks. In 2017, um, Microsoft was able to uh, reach human parity on the switchboard benchmark. Um, and IBM also was able to do this um, at roughly the same time. So this is charting the progress of ASR over the years. So similarly, uh, I'll just briefly kind of 
um, introduce a few text to speech or speech synthesis systems which have been very influential over the years. So uh, this was um, a very mechanical system by Homer Dudley in 1939. And so this was uh, just, you had a bunch of pedals and a bunch of keys, so almost like a piano. And if a trained operator was using this uh, mechanical system, then you could produce um, sounds which actually sound like human speech. So let's listen to a sample. Okay, it's uh, clearly, uh, we can do a lot better, but it sounds a little like, uh, somewhat like human speech. So this was one of the very first prototypes. And Homer Dudley actually, um, his motivation was slightly different. So this was based on something called the vocoder or the voice coder. And his motivation was to reduce the bandwidth of telephone speech transmission over, um, uh, over uh, telephone lines so that he could um, transmit lots of information over the same line. But uh, ultimately, that's not what it was used for. Uh, but this is, the f this is credit to be credited to be one of the first uh, speech synthesis systems. So here, uh, this speech synthesis system um, decomposes uh, the speech signal into what's called the source filter model. So the source is your voice box or your glottis, and the filter is your vocal tract. And um, you can think of making an even more fine-grained decomposition. So where you're actually characterizing the vocal tract using its resonant frequencies, also known as formants. So here, uh, Gunnar Fant uh, built what is known as this formant synthesizer. And this is specifically for vowels. So let's listen to how that sounds. How are you? I love you. And now we're slowly moving to rule-based uh, systems. This was also inherently a formant and synthesizer. So this was MI Talk, which was developed at MIT in 1979. And this uh, does slightly better. Speech is so familiar, a feature of daily life, that we rarely pause to define it. So it's still very robotic, but you can see that the quality is certainly better than the previous uh, systems. And one very famous example of this formant and synthesizer, so a celebrity who uses it, is Stephen Hawking. Um, so when you heard this, you might, had a, you might have had a flashback to you know, how he sounds when he speaks. Uh, so this was in 1979. In the 1990s, there, was, um, there were a set of techniques known as concatenative speech synthesis techniques, um, and also known as unit selection speech synthesis techniques, where you have a large database of short speech segments, and then you try and string together a bunch of these speech segments to put together a, a full a synthesized utterance. Uh, so this was in the 90s, and since the 2000s, um, another paradigm which is now very popular is what is known as parametric uh, synthesis or statistical models of a speech synthesis, where now you've actually kind of distilled all of the information from this database of speech segments into a model. So now you have parameters of your model, and these are more amenable to being adapted as opposed to a database where now if you want to transfer uh, to someone else's voice, you'll have to go and again collect speech segments from that person. Um, so parametric synthesis, um, speech, speech synthesis systems didn't, the quality of the synthesized speech segments was not as good as the concatenative synthesis uh, speech, uh, the, the synthesized clips. But uh, currently the state of the art um, is WaveNet, so I'll just talk about that in a minute. Uh, before that, I'll play one clip which uses a parametric uh, speech synthesis system, and this is work out of Professor Hema Murthy's lab. Um, she has led efforts on this, and they've worked extensively on uh, text-to-speech uh, systems for Indian languages. Yeah, so that you can, I think most of us could tell exactly what the words were in that uh, speech signal. And uh, in 2016, um, so I'll talk a little about exactly what the decomposition of this parametric speech synthesis model is. But in 2016, um, Google's DeepMind released what is called WaveNet, where they tried to directly model the raw audio form. And this is uh, stated to be the current state of the art. So you can just listen to one speech segment. The Blue Lagoon is a 1980 American romance and adventure film directed by Randall Kleiser. So this, is, uh, not, this sounds really good, and even the intonations are uh, fairly good. So I didn't play the other clips from the concatenative system, which also actually doesn't sound too bad. But this is um, kind of considered to be the current state of the art, which is uh, WaveNet. 
Okay, so we talked about the history of both of these speech technologies, so that's ASR and TTS. So let me briefly go through the main components of, a, an, of an ASR system. So uh, these are essentially the main components. So you start with uh, a database of labeled speech. So you have speech uh, utterances and the corresponding transcriptions. Uh, you have a, a feature extractor or an acoustic analysis model which takes the raw speech waveforms and then converts them into some acoustic features. Then you have an acoustic model which uh, learns a mapping between these acoustic feature sequences and subword units which represent sounds, so these are phones. So these acoustic models are probabilistic models which are mapping your speech uh, features into these subword units which are uh, known as phonemes. So typically, uh, like I mentioned when I was talking about the history, uh, HMMs were um, highly prevalent um, within the acoustic models, but nowadays this has been completely replaced by deep neural networks, convolutional neural networks, and even recurrent neural networks. The, the uh, third component is what's called a pronunciation model. So uh, recall I said that the acoustic model maps your acoustic feature sequences to phones. So something needs to map the phone sequences to words. And so that's where the pronunciation model comes into play. So the pronunciation model is typically expert driven. So someone says that, okay, this sequence of phones in this language corresponds to this word. So this is a model which is typically not learned uh, as opposed to the acoustic model and the language model. And finally, you have uh, the language model which comes in and says that this ordering of words is what makes most sense for this language. So if I have a sentence, um, I, climbed, I climbed up the hill, so that's much more likely sequence of words than up the hill I climbed. Actually, that's not too bad, but the hill climbed I up, right? So that's a very unlikely ordering of words. But uh, so the language model is this probabilistic model which reorders words and um, gives you an ordering of which uh, word sequence is most likely. So again, this is also a probabilistic model. So now you have all of these individual components and uh, during test time, you will have a speech waveform and um, the decoder's job is to essentially combine all of these components and construct this large search graph. And it's going to search through this uh, very large search space and try and find the word sequence which best matches the um, uh, speech utterance. So this search space is really, really large, especially for large vocabulary tasks. So one can't actually do an exact search over the search space. And so there are, there's a lot of work on uh, graph search algorithms and how to do um, kind of efficient search across this very, very large search space. So this hopefully gives you an idea about the main components in an ASR system. And even today, state-of-the-art ASR systems still follow the same sets of components. It's just what constitutes these components is slightly different. It used to be uh, uh, HMMs, now it's uh, DNNs. For language models also, recurrent neural networks are a popular choice. And now a very recent trend, which uh, Professor Jawahar also um, mentioned, well, are these end-to-end -end systems. So the pipeline system, so the previous slide, you had these different components and they are set, to, set up together in a pipeline. So it has its advantages because you can train each of these models individually, but uh, errors in one um, component are going to propagate to other components. So ideally, you would like to train all of them jointly as a single model. And so currently, there's a lot of uh, interest in uh, developing these end-to-end -end neural ASR systems. So here, they are directly trained using pairs of speech clips and the corresponding word sequences or character sequences. Um, until recently, these were not at par with the traditional uh, ASR systems. But there's very recent work from Google, I mean, as recent as three weeks back, uh, and here they show that these end-to-end -end models outperform a conventional production system. So this is not on any uh, benchmark that we know. It's on an internal benchmark, but we'll trust Google. Uh, so th nobody can verify it, but um, this is um, very recent work, and it's, it's quite exciting because you can get away with the entire pipeline and just train this model end-to-end. -end. So how about uh, TTS systems and what are their main components? So I, I talked about um, these two sets of approaches, which are still uh, very prominent today. So one is concatenative synthesis, where you have a bunch of subword units, and you have this large speech database. You have to string them together to find uh, the synthesized clip corresponding to a text string. So here you have issues like how large should each unit be, which you're storing in the database. 
and you also have certain costs associated with which unit you're going to use and what is the cost um, associated with actually stringing these units together. So there's a concatenation cost as well. So you can put these costs together and um, formulate an optimization problem and come up with some good costs. So this is one approach. And then there's the parametric synthesis um, based uh, set of approaches where you're now using a learned model to generate speech. So here is a, a schematic for um, what are the main components in a parametric TTS system. So you, you have the uh, training part where again you have, yeah. So you have a, a set of labeled speech. So you have speech utterances and their corresponding text. The text goes through some text analysis mod, uh, module. So it's converted into say underlying phonemes, uh, prosody characteristics, like where should accents go and so on. And the speech analysis module extracts features from the underlying speech like uh, excitatory features and uh, spectral features and so on. And then you train a model. So this could be either an HMM or a DNN based model. And so once you have this model, you use the model to uh, generate observations. So acoustic observations, and then you maximize the probability of having generated those observations. And once you have those, you pass it through a set of signal processing algorithms, which are also known as vocoders, and then you get out speech. So uh, these are the, this is the standard um, pipeline of a parametric TTS system. But uh, there are many challenges which are remaining. So one is, how do you easily adapt to new voices? So this, is, this has been explored a lot for HMM-based models, but not as much for DNN-based models. Also, how do you effectively handle uh, emotions and accents when you're trying to generate speech? And uh, basically, uh, can you get expressive speech which sounds natural? Uh, another challenge is, uh, how would you do TTS for low resource languages and also dialects? So these are some open problems that are uh, very interesting for TTS. Uh, there are also many remaining challenges for ASR. So I want to list a few of them here. So the first is uh, something which is very hard even today, which is how do you handle noisy real life settings where you have multiple speakers and this is a very common setting when you're sitting in meetings, say, or if you're in get togethers and multiple of you are speaking. Uh, the second point is something which is going to become very important and there's a lot of interest in it because um, there's this proliferation of mobile devices, right? So um, almost everyone is going to have a mobile device very soon and not everyone is going to be connected to the internet. So it's very interesting to think about whether we can build embedded ASR systems which are doing speech recognition offline entirely. So can you build something which is low latency something which, is not, which does not have a very high computational overhead, but at the same time is accurate. Um, another very interesting research direction is that can we reduce duplicated effort? So uh, Professor Jawahar again talked about transfer learning. So can we use uh, transfer learning techniques across multiple dialects, domains, languages without duplicating effort that you have already uh, invested in some other languages? Um, then you want uh, ASR solutions which are robust to variations in age, uh, variations in accents, variations in ability. So say you have some speech uh, disorder or you, you, you have a stutter and so on. Uh, it should be robust to various uh, settings of these sorts. And the last is very relevant to um, multilingual communities like we have in India, which is that it should be able to handle code switching or code mixing. So I'll talk about that in um, the coming slides. So I'm just going to briefly talk about two directions uh, which are personally interesting to me as well. So accents uh, pose a serious challenge to state-of-the-art ASR systems. So let's On top of all that, the weeds keep growing and the garbage has to be taken out. Okay. So I think everyone, all of us recognized it. So on top of all that, the weeds keep growing and the garbage has to be taken out. Uh, so this is what uh, the Google um, a ASR system, which is trained on Indian accented speech, uh, recognizes the sentence to be. So there are a few errors, and this is, um, these errors should, really shouldn't have been there because the speech segment is very clean. Uh, she really enunciated the words clearly. Uh, this is, I just want to mention, this is a voice sample from a very new corpus called the Mozilla Common Voice Corpus. And Mozilla has invested a lot of effort in collecting a lot of accented speech. And this is all open, all their efforts are open source. And so this uh, corpus is available for anyone to uh, play around with. Uh, so there's, there was a recent thesis uh, which came out of uh, University of Washington where um, Rachel Tartman explored that humans 
easily adapt to uh, the variations in speech, while ASR systems have a lot of trouble with it. So she experimented with a number of state-of-the-art ASR solutions, and they uh, consistently did not do well on um, uh, accented speech. So, yeah. So this is um, um, a bar plot from uh, Deep Speech 2, which is a system which came out of uh, Baidu. Baidu is um, a big company in China, which uh, invested a lot in doing speech recognition. So here, uh, the bars in blue correspond to the error rates from Deep Speech 2. And this is on various accents. And the bars in red are your uh, human errors. So you can see that the human errors are consistently lower than the Deep Speech 2 error rates, except for the Indian accented speech. So at least in Deep Speech 2, they seem to be doing a good job on uh, Indian accents. So um, how much time do I have? OK, so then I'm just going to completely skip through this. But this is uh, recent work that um, I started with um, collaborators. And this was work that started at uh, MSR India's workshop on artificial social intelligence in June. And uh, we focused on whether we can identify accents from an underlying speech, uh, uh, from a speech utterance. So this is not accent adaptation, but this is hopefully a first step towards uh, building accent-aware uh, voice-driven systems. And the second open problem that uh, I think is very interesting for anyone who is uh, working in India on speech problems is that uh, it should be able to handle code switching. So here's an example of code switching, which is uh, very common. So, uh, so you imagine you would say, I was going for a movie yesterday, Raste mein mujhe sudha mil gai. So this is where you're combining two codes. And this is um, also referred to as intersentential uh, mixing, right? because you, you're maintaining the entire grammatical structure uh, in both languages. And this is an example of code mixing, where you're embedding uh, words or phrases from one language into uh, another language. So here, for instance, uh, it says, I kal movie dekhne ja rahi thi, aur raste mein I met Sudha. So these kinds of utterances are very challenging for computational systems. Agar aap inke follower hai, to is page ko like kare. So hopefully, um, everyone was able to follow that. But if you um, asked uh, a Hindi, Google's Hindi ASR system to recognize this, um, it would say, agar aap inke follow health, because it thinks then the so the language model thinks that it should follow should be followed by an English word. So it's, it's hard for it to figure out you know, when to switch from one language to another. So this is a particularly challenging problem and something, again, that we have uh, started work on, but which I'm going to skip in the interest of time. Um, so I'm going to stop with um, some conclusions. If the, yeah. So speech technologies have been obviously a great success. Uh, but it's not on par with humans yet. So it, it was able to match human error rates on uh, one or two benchmark tasks. But uh, it's still not there yet in terms of handling accents, handling noisy environments, and so on. Uh, one very interesting question is, can machines learn speech as efficiently as humans do? And this would be uh, particularly relevant for lower resource languages, where you don't have a lot of uh, labeled data. Um, so currently, there's a lot of excitement about reaching human parity, but maybe we should strive for beyond human parity. Because um, so the uh, Microsoft paper uh, does a very detailed analysis of machine errors and human errors. And what they find is there's a lot of equivalence between the machine and human errors. So which means that uh, you have a machine which is doing almost as well as a human, but it doesn't have the problems a human would go through, like a human would get distracted, fatigue. And these are transcribers, so maybe they are working under some pressures and so on. So maybe we should strive for beyond human parity and not just stop at reaching human parity. And uh, finally, um, effectively, we want to do, we want to um, communicate well with machines. So maybe we want to move uh, beyond speech as well in the coming decade. So probably we want an amalgam of speech, gestures, expressions, and so on. So I'll stop with that, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Preeti. Uh, again, we'll take probably one question in the interest of time. So for uh, speech here, uh, speech synthesis, do people try to model the physics of the vocal cord and vocal tract and try to yes. so uh, there know, is, reduce yeah, there the is, amount of data required by doing that? Yes, model? absolutely. So there's one set of approaches which I didn't talk about at all, which is articulatory synthesis, where uh, they do build very detailed models of the vocal tract 
and how the, so the speech production uh, mechanism and use information about that to build models. So there again, um, the overhead is that you need to build these very detailed models, but then you can get away without yeah, having these large databases. Yes. So, so, so that which, is, which uh, approach works better in practice? Like, you have, has that So maybe I, I'll, I'll defer to okay. Professor Hema Murthy, but I, I, I think um, no systems currently use articulatory uh, synthesis. Yeah, so most, most systems still use concatenative synthesis where you have databases of these small segments and you put them. Okay, we'll just have one more question probably, yeah. Do you have systems which actually combine visual cues also? Uh, because oh, lip like reading is very common actually. Like, uh, so you mean lip, uh, li I mean, uh, reading? Oh, lip reading. Lip reading yeah, or yeah, yeah. just? Yeah. Yes, there yes. So there are systems that? which do um, uh, audio visual, I mean visual speech recognition. No, no, so, I'm saying combining oh. both. Yes, so there's oh, also okay. audio visual speech okay. recognition. And so there, uh, some promising approaches have been using probabilistic graphical models. So you have various random variables where you know, the random variables mesh, kind of yeah. modeling right. the movements of the lips, then you have random variables which are modeling the acoustic features and so on. Yes, there's been work on that as well. I know there are a lot more questions, but we are really running over time. Preeti's around, so I think we should, you know, talk to her during tea or any of the breaks that we have.